Hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Introduction to Cultural Studies. We'll begin with the final text for this course today, um, which is Slavoj Žižek's Welcome to the Desert of the Rio, which is essentially five essays on September 11 and related dates. And this will be the final text as just mentioned, and we'll just wind up the course, uh, not just with this text, but, but sort of rehearsing some of the things which we have covered across the text throughout this course. So before we begin with this particular book, uh, just a few sentences, a few, um, you know, uh, information about Zizek and uh, its location and current uh, philosophy and current um, philosophical uh, debates. So Rosalba Zizek um, um, is a very provocative philosopher. So he's someone who writes in a very provocative tradition. He's, uh, uh, he's someone who, you know, draws on Lacan uh, quite, quite a lot. So you find there's a very Lacanian element in this particular book as well. And he's, of course, a post-structuralist um, in some sense. And, and, you know, he uses, he draws in post-structuralism, uh, post-Azorian um, post-structuralism in his works. So it's a very interesting uh, mixture of post-structuralism, Lacanian psychoanalysis, and, of course, post-modernism that he employs in terms of looking at the text uh, that he chooses. And when I say text, uh, I'm not just talking about uh, written texts or films, but he also looks at events. He also looks at social phenomena and treats those as texts as well. So uh, Zizek is, uh, you know, he's very, very popular. He's one of the very popular uh, philosophers of our modern times. And sometimes his popularity, uh, you know, undercuts to a certain extent his robust research, uh, you know, content, which is there in his essays. But this particular, the reason why I've chosen this book, uh, Welcome to the Desert of the Rio, is because it talks about uh, I mean, it draws on popular culture a lot, the references to Hollywood films, Hollywood cinema, so the references to Matrix, the Matrix trilogy, uh, the references to Apocalypse Now and, you know, Truman Show, a whole host of other Hollywood films. Uh, but also, I think it's a very important book in, a, in terms of looking at culture studies in the context of 9-11, uh, what happens to uh, the Western metaphysical tradition post 9-11, what happens to the Western cultural um, you know, construct post 9-11. And when I say Western, I of course mean, uh, you know, West European and American, right? That's the definition, that's a working definition of Western, which I use for this particular book. But what Zizek is doing, he's very interestingly combining the consumption of reality shows, he's combining the consumption of popular uh, cinema, popular television, with the traumatophilia. Uh, that came after post 9-11 and traumatophilia of course is an affiliation as a love for trauma, as a love for consuming trauma. So what he does essentially in this book, he looks at how uh, trauma becomes a commodity, a visual commodity which is consumed uh, ad infinitum, ad nosim uh, actually um, and it's just repeated over and over again and how the entire grammar of reputation of trauma, of a real traumatic event, it draws on uh, the grammar of cinema, the grammar of popular cinema, the grammar of um, hypervisual cinema. And among the other things which this book does, it talks about the very interesting blurring of borderlines between reality and virtuality. There's something that we uh, saw anticipated to a certain extent in, in, in Leotard's postborn condition. Uh, and of course, the, big, the biggest philosopher for that is, uh, is Baudelaire. Uh, who has this magnificent concept called a Samuel Crum, or a Samuel Crum, which is a plural, which is obviously a spectacle, a, a hyper-real spectacle. So uh, Zizek too, in this particular book, he talks about hyper-reality as a commodity. So the hyper-reality of a particular event, the hyper-reality of the representation of a particular event, it becomes a, a consumable commodity, a visual commodity, which then very quickly uh, translates uh, true popular media into uh, a, a cool commodity, a pop commodity. So Zizek is, in a way, uh, the philosopher of the pop, uh, the philosopher of popular culture, the philosopher of the contemporary culture, of the daily mess of life, if you will. But like I mentioned a little while ago, he is also someone who draws on a Lacanian uh, you know, psychoanalysis quite a bit, uh, post-structuralism as well as, um, you know, he's very much um, you know, of a postmodernist philosopher, so he makes references to Peter Slaughter Dick, for instance, uh, who's got his magnificent book called A Critique of Cynical Reason, and uh, also the references that he comes up with, uh, Hegel as well. And, uh, he, he frequently mentions Hegel, he frequently alludes to Hegel uh, in terms of deconstructing him, uh, you know, uh, we're using as a very interesting mixture of Lacanian psychoanalysis and 
uh, post-structuralism. So Zizek is a philosopher in that kind of tradition. So I'm j I just took a little bit of time to, in terms of defining or describing uh, Zizek's location in, in current uh, philosophical debates. Right, okay, so as you can see, uh, this particular book, the very title of the book has an exclamation, Welcome to the Desert of Rio, which is uh, actually a line, uh, um, a dialogue, a quotation from the film. Uh, Matrix, uh, and, uh, and of course, there uh, are very you know, abundant references to, to Matrix throughout this book, as we will find out very, very quickly. Okay, now, uh, so I'll just start with the opening, and we'll see how uh, you know, Zizek sets out the question of agency in the opening. So, the question of will agency and articulating agency become important uh, in Zizek's analysis, and he gives a very uh, dark, funny example. Uh, of agency, or, lo or loss of agency in this particular section. And this introduction is titled The Missing Ink. Uh, so it's a, it's a bit of a joke, a communist joke, uh, a communist German joke. But it, it serves a very important purpose in terms of defining uh, agency or describing what agency really is. Uh, so this is what the joke is, and I'll just read out in, uh, line by line. So in an old joke from the defunct German Democratic Republic, a German worker gets a job in Siberia. Aware of how all mail will be read by its census, he tells his friends, let's establish a code. If a letter you get from me is written in ordinary blue ink, it's true. If it's written in red ink, it's false. So, you know, this is what the, you know, the narrative is, uh, and that is a German worker gets sent to Siberia because he's you know, suspected of uh, anti-government activities. And before he goes, he's aware of the fact that all his letters will be censored and read on the way. So he establishes a code with his friends. And that is, you know, if his letter is written in the ordinary blue ink, it is true, the content of the letter is true. If it's written in red ink, then it's false. Then he just reversed the uh, logic. After a month, his friends get a first letter written in blue ink. And this is what the letter reads. Everything is wonderful here. The shops are full, food is abundant, Apartments are large and properly heated. Cinemas show films from the West. There are many beautiful girls ready for an affair. The only thing you can't get is red ink. Okay, now obviously this is very, very funny, but uh, beneath the humor, what you actually see is a very, very crucial and complex um, question, and that is the red ink becomes the, the single signifier uh, f to articulate what you really feel like, how you really feel like, and you don't have that tool, you don't have the instrument. So you get everything else, you get, uh, you know, you get to do affairs, you get to watch films, you get to eat great food, everything is available to you in abundance. But the only thing you don't get in this kind of a the constricted condition is the instrument through which you can tell people what you really feel like or how you really feel like. So that, that becomes a very important uh, definition of agency, existential agency. So, uh, this is what Zizek says. The structure here is more refined than it might appear. Although the worker is unable to signal that, that what he is saying is a lie in a pre-arranged way, he nonetheless succeeds in getting his message across. How? By inscribing the very reference to the code into the encoded message as one of his elements. Of course, this is a standard problem of self-reference. Since the letter is written in blue, is its entire content therefore not true? The answer is that the very fact that a lack of red ink is mentioned signals that it should have been written in red ink. So, again, this becomes a very important uh, philosophical uh, debate. So, uh, the red ink is mentioned in the letter, and you know, Zizek says, the, the worker says, oh, yeah, we don't get red ink. So, it's open to different kinds of interpretations, it's open to different kinds of semantic possibilities. So, one semantic possibility, one interpretative possibility is because red ink is mentioned as an absence, then therefore you ought to read the entire letter as if it were written in red ink. So in that sense, you know, in that case, that would be reversed. The entire meaning, the entire content would be reversed. So uh, you'd have to guess, you'd have to interpret that a worker in Siberia is having a very tough time. Okay, the nice point is that the mention of the lack of red ink produces the effect of truth independently of its own literal truth. So absence produces truth away. Absence produces uh, you know, a dialectical truth in a way, independently of its own literal truth. Even if red ink really was available, the lie that is unavailable is the only way to get the true message across in a specific condition of censorship. Now, the reason why Zizek is using this example is that he talks about, very quickly you'll see, 
he talks about the uh, the new liberal condition, which appears to give you appears to you know uh, attribute all kinds of freedom except you know the real conditions of freedom. So the reading, the missing reading, becomes uh, the missing uh, bits of real freedom. So you get everything else, but you don't get what you really need in order to articulate what how you really feel or what you really are. So it is a specific condition of censorship. Uh, it is a particular kind of censorship that has been described over here. And obviously we are aware of the fact now that this can quickly translate into a question of agency. So agency, will, free will, uh, these things become very important uh, in a new liberal context. So what Zizek would do very quickly is I was going to compare uh, the fascist content, uh, the fascist context with a new liberal context, with the fascist context uh, with a strong totalitarian context, uh, you know for sure that you don't get any freedom, there is absolutely no freedom available, etc. Uh, but in a new liberal context, uh, in a new liberal capitalist context, you appear to get all kinds of freedom, you appear to get all kinds of agency, except perhaps the only true agency which is what, which is describing what you really are or how you really are. So that is unavailable to you. So the missing wedding can be seen as a signifier a symbolic signifier of the missing true agency in a specific uh, censorship context uh, or censorship condition. Is this not the matrix of an efficient critique of ideology, not only in totalitarian conditions of censorship, but perhaps even more in a more refined conditions of liberal censorship? So this is what I just meant when I said that uh, this would be applicable, this would perhaps uh, be more relatable to more liberal censorship, right? So the more liberal conditions of censorship, you know, that becomes more, this example becomes more resonant, more potent in that kind of a condition. One starts by agreeing that one has all the freedom one wants, or freedoms uh, one wants. Then one merely adds, the only missing thing is the reading. We feel free because we like the very language to articulate our unfreedom. So you know, again, this is a very, a provocative kind of language, but it's quite potent and quite articulate as well. So the reading becomes a language to articulate your unfreedom, the fact that you're not free. How do you say you're not free? So the reading becomes a symbolic signifier uh, of articulating or for articulating that kind of unfreedom, but then that is unavailable to you in a liberal context. So suppose if you just go back to the letter, and suppose you read it to be literally true, you know, it's perhaps you know, really true. I mean, what, what has been said, the content is, you know, what, is really, what, what really is in that particular condition. You get everything. You get food, you get um, you know, cinema, you get you know, entertainment, you get recreation, you get all kinds of men and women to have affairs with. Suppose all that is true. Uh, but what's also true then is you don't get red ink. So in that case, what, what it means is suppose you have a situation where you have to sort of articulate the fact that you're not true. You don't have that option. So you always have to pretend that you're always happy and you always have agency, right? So agency becomes a very uh, strategic device over here, a very strategic condition, uh, a conditional experience. So you have, oh, you have agency as long as you don't have the instrument, uh, you're not aware of the instrument that, you know, in order to tell people that you're not free. So as long as you're not aware of that, you have entire agency. But the moment you become aware of it, the fact that you don't have the instrument to articulate your non-freedom, uh, your awareness, that particular awareness, the moment of awareness, that will make you uh, will less uh, to a great extent. So, you know, as you can see, uh, what Zizek is doing, using an example from Communist Germany, or the joke from Communist Germany, is tying that with the liberal context that we uh, internalize and inhabit today uh, in a world we live in today, a very capitalist, new liberal kind of world. Okay, so, and then he goes on to say, what this lack of red ink means is that today all the main terms we use to designate the present conflict, war on terrorism, democracy and freedom, human rights and so on, are false alarms. Mystifying our perception of the situation instead of allowing us to think it. So, uh, you know, Zizek says that the, the missing red ink can be read, you know, as an allegory of a present times where we are talking about the war on terrorism, you know, the war, uh, the conflict of democracy and freedom, uh, human rights, etc. So all those become false alarms, which are designed to sort of deviate our attention or distract our attention from the real issues that, that concern us. So these are designed to mystify our perception of the situation instead of allowing us to think of it. In this precise sense, our freedoms themselves serve to mask and sustain our deeper unfreedom. So the freedom becomes an instrument for unfreedom in this kind of a context. So that's a paradox that Zizek is 
uh, exploring in this particular context. A hundred years ago, in its emphasis on the acceptance of some fixed dogma as a condition of demanding actual freedom, uh, Gilbert Keith Chesterton uh, perspicuously detected the anti-democratic potential, the very principle of freedom of thought. So, you know, Chesterton obviously is a great writer in the satiric tradition, so is one of the finest um, you know, exponents of satire in English literature, G.K. Chesterton. Now, he gives a very interesting example, and Zizek draws an example in terms of how um, you know, the anti-democratic potential is always embedded uh, in the so-called freedom of thought. So freedom of thought can actually be quite anti-democratic in its own way. And how is that so? And this is uh, Zizek quoting Chesterton. We may say broadly that free thought is the best of all safeguards against freedom. Managed in a modern style, the emancipation of the slave's mind is the best way to preventing the emancipation of the slave. Teach him to worry about whether he wants to be free and he not free himself. So uh, this is a very ironic example, but it serves the purpose that Zizek wants to convey to us, and that is freedom of thought uh, can actually be a very interesting uh, you know, safeguard against freedom of you know, real freedom. So if you, if you make someone free mentally, uh, if you make someone worry about freedom, then that person will never want to free himself. So this is what Chesterton says over here. Teach him to worry about whether he wants to be free and will not free himself. Right? So if someone is taught to be, you know, if he wants to be free or not, uh, then that person will never end up freeing himself because he will realize that you know, freedom comes at a cost. Freedom is always partial in its capacity, so it's no such thing as absolute freedom. So the best way to keep a slave and slave forever is to free the slave's mind into thinking whether he wants to be free or not. Uh, and once the slave, you know, duels in that thought, once the slave tries to sort of, you know, uh, attain that ambivalence in terms of whether or not he wants to be free or not, he'll never end up becoming free. Right? So, uh, mental freedom and real freedom are at odds with each other in this particular example. And uh, Zizek draws an example and then he goes on to bring in Kant, Immanuel Kant as well. And this is what he says, is this not emphatically true of our postmodern time with its freedom to deconstruct doubt, dissentiate itself, oneself? We should not forget that Chesterton makes exactly the same claim as Kant uh, in his What is Enlightenment. Think as much as you like and as freely as you like, just obey. All right? So you know, even Kant in his um, essay, What is Enlightenment, has a similar kind of paradox or offers a similar kind of paradox where he says, Think as much as you like. You can, you know, you have all the freedom to think, you have all the freedom of thought and expression, but just as long as you obey, as long as you stick to uh, a particular kind of behavior. The only difference is that Chesterton is more specific and spells out the implicit paradox beneath the Kantian reasoning. Not only does freedom of thought not undermine uh, actual social servitude, it positively sustains it. So the paradox of Chesterton articulates is that freedom of thought actually informs social servitude. It sustains social servitude. So freedom of thought is not really an emancipation. Freedom of thought over here acts as an anti-emancipation. So again, the question of agency becomes uh, quite complex. So you have the agency to think, but the agency to think, the freedom of thought uh, actually works opposite direction, the freedom of you know, your social self, that, that actually go you know, in opposite directions. The old motto, don't think, obey, to which Kant reacts as counterproductive. It's, it effectively breeds rebellion. The only way to secure social servitude is through freedom of thought. So it's a very Chesterton's uh, definition of uh, you know, sustaining social servitude through freedom of thought becomes a very important example to Zizek, particularly in the new liberal capitalist context that we inhabit today. So Chesterton is also logical uh, enough to assert the obverse of Kant's motto. The struggle for freedom needs a reference to some unquestionable dogma. Right, so the unquestionable dogma is obviously here servitude, social servitude, or slavery. So, you know, freedom can only come once you acknowledge the unquestionable dogma. Uh, so, as long as you uh, admit or acknowledge or you know remain within the, the the scope of the unquestionable dogma, you have all the freedom of thought that you require uh, in order to be a free thinking person. So, again, we are looking at a very um, you know postmodern uh, and very post structuralist take on agency. Uh, that's something that Zizek is, uh, you know, capitalizing quite well. Now, the next chapter uh, that Zizek moves on to is called the passions of the real, passions of semblance. Now, obviously, uh, real is used in a Lacanian sense by Zizek over here. Uh, and that's something that 
he is uh, drawing on quite heavily. Now, let us take a look at some of the examples that Zizek offers. So, on page 10, uh, he gives a list of commodities and how this question on real and unreal, um, you know, at an ontological level becomes very, very complex in post one commodity culture and how is that so. So, this particular uh, paragraph which opens, um, you know, uh, and does describe in today's market becomes a very important example for Zizek. And this is what uh, it is. On today's market, we find a whole series of products deprived of their malignant properties. Coffee without caffeine, cream without fat, beer without alcohol, and the list goes on. So, the question of producing more commodities become you know, very, very crucial away. Now, what is happening is, on the surface, you know, it's a benevolent act. It's, it's, on the surface, it's a benevolent commodity that we have in coffee without caffeine. So, you still consume uh, the beverage without the, the harmful effect of caffeine. You still consume cream without the fat. You still consume beer without the alcohol. Now, what it also does uh, is that the unquestionable dogma that we just mentioned a little while ago, the unquestionable dogma is consumption. Now, it multiplies consumption. It does not decrease consumption. It multiplies consumption, on, and, but on the surface, it gives you more options. It increases your agency. So, again, the freedom of thought, the freedom of choice becomes uh, available to you at a surface superficial level, but then it comes at a cost and the cost over here is the question of you know obedience to a particular dogma, unquestionable dogma and unquestionable dogma of course uh, becomes uh, you know the, the dictates of capitalism, the dictates of uh, you know uh, consumerism etc. Okay, now what this also does is you know this particular commodity culture where you have something without, uh, and which is defined by an absence. So, uh, a particular beverage is defined by the absence of caffeine, a particular uh, food is defined by the absence of cream. So, you know, this definition through absence is a very good example at a very micro level of what happens on a macro level, you know, the blurring borderlines between the virtual and the real, between the absent and the present. And that's something that, that kind of an entanglement, that borderline blurring is something that Zizek is very keen to explore. And this is what it does in page 11, where it talks about virtual reality. So, what is virtual reality? So, virtual reality simply generalizes this procedure of offering a product deprived of its substance. So, as I've just mentioned, at a micro level, we have something like coffee without caffeine uh, or beer without alcohol. So, you know, it, it gives you beverage without apparently taking away the harmful content. But what happens actually is it gives you another beverage. So, it, it makes you consume more. So, virtual reality works in a very similar structural way. And that is, it simply generalizes uh, the, this procedure of offering a product deprived of a substance. It provides the reality itself deprived of a substance, of the hard, resistant kernel of the real. Just as decaffeinated coffee smells and tastes like real coffee without being real coffee, virtual reality is experienced as reality without being so. Uh, so, as you can see, this is what I mentioned. When I, this is what I meant when I mentioned that Zizek uh, is a philosopher of the pop tradition. So he brings in pop culture uh, quite an extent, uh, and in terms of uh, describing his philosophy, and he's obviously looking at the blurry borderlines between virtuality and reality. And he says it happens at a micro commodity level and a micro consumption level, but also at a macro level of consumption and consumerism, where you're not quite sure that what you're consuming is real or virtual. Right, uh, so virtual reality is experienced as reality without being so. Just like you know, decaffeinated coffee is consumed as coffee without being so, and the same can be spoken uh, for in a virtual reality uh, at a macro level, at a more hyper real level, at a more spectacular level. So what happens at the end of this process of virtualization, however, is that we begin to experience real reality itself as a virtual reality, as a virtual entity. So again, our experience of real reality gets problematized once we get exposed to virtual reality, right? So, virtual reality you know, problematizes or unsettles our perception, unsettles our cognitive schema in terms of understanding of reality because then we can't make the differentiation between virtual reality and real reality. Okay, and then there's a mention that GJ makes to uh, the World Trade Center explosions, 9-11 attacks and he talks about how those attacks were consumed in popular media as, you know, not just uh, acts of terrorism, but also as some kind of quasi virtual reality. And with the same grammar of hyper realism, the same grammar of spectacle, uh, the same grammar of Samuel Crumb that we that are employed in popular cinema. And uh, again, we're looking at an entanglement between popular cinema and what happens in real life. So, the way 
uh, the entire World Trade Center attack was packaged and visualized and consumed as a visual spectacle. It's very, very similar to the way we consume uh, the visual spectacle of cinema, hyperreal cinema, science fiction cinema, etc. And this is what Zizek says quite clearly. For the great majority of the public, the World Trade Center explosions were events on the TV screen. And when we watched the oft repeated shot of frightened people running towards the camera ahead of the giant cloud of dust, from the collapsing tower, was not the framing of the shot itself reminiscent of spectacular shots in catastrophic movies, a, a, special, a special effect uh, which outdid all others since as Jeremy Bentham name, reality is the best appearance of itself. So it's a very provocative uh, description as you can see and quite disturbing as well, where Zizek says that you know, the way the people ran, the way the people consume uh, the World Trade Center collapse in television screen, the way the camera is consumed and the camera is you know, conveyed the entire destruction is not similar to the way that cameras convey a particular scene in, in a movie, in a catastrophic movie. And it's not similar to the way we consume a catastrophic movie. So what's the difference ontologically speaking between real reality and virtual reality? So this is like decaffeinated coffee as well. So suppose you're watching a catastrophic movie on TV. Uh, we were just consuming a spectacle on TV, aren't we? Uh, but then suppose we're also watching the World Trade Center collapse on TV, uh, which has a very similar kind of spectacle. So it doesn't blur the borderline between the real even and the virtual even. So again, we're looking at the uh, blurring borderlines between reality and virtuality in everyday life, uh, you know, in postmodern times. So that's something Zizek is, uh, you know, is very keen uh, to sort of uh, highlight. Okay, so, and then, you know, he talks about how there's a plethora of films, a plethora of cinema, which does exact, which do exactly this, and that is, it, it dramatizes the, the blurring borderline between virtuality and reality, and it makes life look like a reality show. And the way we consume uh, reality TV, the way we consume reality show, uh, you know, that makes a, that has a deep impact on the way we look at life post reality show. And of course, as we all know, there's nothing real about reality show. It's entirely orchestrated. It's entire, uh, it's entirely choreographed. Uh, it's a set up thing. By the way it is presented and the way it's consumed to us, uh, we believe in it. We believe in the reality of the virtual spectacle. And then what that also makes us believe is the virtuality of the real spectacle. Okay, so this ontological blurring is something that Zizek is highlighting uh, very dramatically uh, in this section. So the authentic 20th, 20th century passion for penetrating the real thing through the cobweb of semblances which constitutes our reality thus culminates in the thrill of the real as the ultimate effect sought after from digitalized special effects through reality TV and amateur pornography up to snuff movies. So, and then he talks about uh, different kinds of movies which have been made uh, in recent times. And a recent example that he offers is uh, Peter Weir's A True Man Show. And this is page 13 on his screen. The most recent example of this is Peter Weir's The True Man Show, a uh, movie in 1998, with Jim Carrey playing a small town clerk who gradually discovers the truth that he's a hero of a permanent 24-hour uh, TV show. So, you know, this particular film is a, it's a really interesting film, and I do recommend you watch it. Uh, it's a supremely postmodern film in the sense that, you know, a man suddenly realizes that his entire life, his entire space is actually a movie studio. It's a reality show, and all the people around him are actors. Uh, he's the only one not acting. So he's very much, he's a set piece inside a reality show, which is consumed uh, externally by you know, millions of people outside. Okay, so his hometown is in fact a gigantic studio set uh, with cameras following him everywhere. Uh, among his predecessors, it is worth mentioning uh, Philip K. Dick's Time Out of Join, in which the hero, living in a, a modest daily life in a small idyllic Californian city in the 1950s, gradually discovers that the whole town is a fake stage to keep him satisfied. The underlying experience of Time Out of Join and the Truman Show is that the late capitalist consumer's Californian paradise is, in its very happy reality, in a way unreal, uh, substance-less, deprived of material inertia. So California over here becomes a capitalist, um, you know, uh, a cornucopia of capitalist uh, uh, pleasures, uh, you know, some kind of capitalist heaven. And so uh, that kind of a life, a Californian life, becomes um, the, the content of a reality show, a perfect reality show, where you know, everything you require is, is you know, dished out to you in great and abundant proportions. So again, life in California and life in a reality show blurred together uh, in these two films, as uh, Zizek uh, analyzes um, you know, that kind of a grammar of spectacle and grammar of consumption. 
Okay, so the hyper reality and the unreality of a uh, uh, sort of ontological kins with each other uh, in Zizek's analysis. So uh, the hyper real quality uh, and the unreal quality they often blend, blend with each other and make our understanding of reality problematic in more ways than one. Uh, and at the same derealization of the horror went on after the World Trade Center collapse. Well, the number of victims, 3,000, is repeated all the time. So, you know, repeatability becomes a very important factor, a very important condition uh, of hyperreality. And it's something that Zizek uh, is pointing out quite clearly over here. And that's something that postmodernism does quite uh, dramatically. And it repeats the spectacle over and over again, uh, postmodern TV, postmodern cinema. And each reputation uh, creates a new kind of effect, a new visual, a new sensory effect uh, in the audience. Okay. Uh, the number of victims, 3,000, is repeated all the time. It is surprising that how little of the actual carnage we see. Uh, no dismembered bodies, no blood, no desperate faces of dying people. In clear contrast, we're reporting on third world catastrophes, where the whole point is to produce a scoop of some gruesome detail. Somalis dying of hunger, the raped Bosnian women, uh, men with the throats cut. So this is a very important difference that Zizek is pointing out. And he's saying essentially that the World Trade Center attack was a first world catastrophe. And look at the way it was uh, dished out on TV. Look at the way it was you know, televised across you know, screens, millions of screens across the world. Uh, we don't get to see any dead bodies. We don't get to see any mangled bodies. All we get to see is a hyper real you know, spectacle of a massive tower being attacked by, um, you know, by, by planes. And then we see the aftermath of the attack. And that is, we see smokes uh, coming out of the, of the you know, buildings. We see the building collapsing. And then we hear the number of people who died, 3,000. The number is given to us uh, all the time. It's repeated all the time in several media and several debates. Now, contrast that to the way uh, catastrophes are reported. Uh, catastrophes in third world are reported to the first world, where we get to see dead bodies. We get to see uh, women who are you know, abused. We get to see, um, you know, people dying of hunger, we get to see terrorists, you know, everything is so visceral and so corporeal. And um, this immediate viscerality, this immediate availability of viscerality is something which becomes uh, a very key component of the grammar of um, communication, the grammar of, uh, you know, transmission when it comes to third world catastrophe and, you know, and contrast that to the very neat and hyper real grammar, almost elegant uh, hyper real grammar of, you know, transmission when it comes to a first world catastrophe, a first world event like uh, the World Trade Center. Okay, so this is uh, a very important ontological contrast that Zizek is um, dramatizing. These charts are always accompanied by an advance warning that some of the images you will see are extremely graphic and may upset children. A warning that we never heard in the reports of the World Trade Center collapse. So, you know, the gruesome bodily images, the gruesome mangled visceral images of the third world catastrophes, they always come with a warning, a disclaimer, that this may not be appropriate for children. So there's something we should be you know, aware of. There's a parental guidance which is given you know, before the actual transmission. But we don't get that thing at all when it comes to uh, the first world catastrophe like World Trade Center collapse, where all we see is a massive building collapsing. We see smokes coming out of it, and then we see a number on the screen which tells us uh, how many people have died. Uh, you know, and there's no warning whatsoever about the violence, about the viscerality of the event. Is this not yet further proof of how, even in this tragic moment, the distance which separates us from them, from their reality, is maintained? The real horror happens there, not here. Okay, so this is a very political statement that Zizek is making, and that is, uh, he's quite clear about the horror, uh, the definition of horror, the reality of the horror the viscerality of the horror. So the viscerality of the horror takes place elsewhere in the third world, uh, not in the first world. So the first world horror is a different kind of horror. It's more of a spectacle which can be consumed in popular media. It's, it's a hyper real spectacle. It's a grand spectacle. It's a grand narrative of destruction. Whereas uh, when it comes to third world spectacles, you know, third world horrors, what happens is we see the immediate bodily representations of that kind of horror. So the real horror happens there not here. So what we have in the first form is a hyper-real horror, right? So the hyper-reality of the horror is something that is dramatized, especially in the way the World Trade Center collapsed with televised and screens. Whereas uh, when it comes to the real horrors, the micro-real horrors, the immediate horrors, 
uh, in the third world that then it's all about bodies and mangled bodies and women and children and you see the faces, you see the bodies, you see the limbs, etc. That's something which is completely absent in any representation of horror in the first world. So as the very opening suggests uh, in, in this particular book, what Zizek is doing is drawing on different kinds of um, you know, resources. He's drawing on popular culture, he's drawing on uh, popular cinema, he's drawing on Lacanian psychoanalysis. So the word real every time Zizek uses it is very Lacanian in its content and quality. Uh, and also he's talking about how uh, the, the different political and ideological implications which are operative in innocuous commodities as well as, uh, you know, really, really discursive uh, commodities. So the innocuous commodity would be, say, coffee without caffeine, whereas the very discursive and you know, immediately profound political commodity is the way, uh, you know, the horror is uh, televised on screen, the World Trade Center horror is televised on screen. So the World Trade Center collapse, uh, the way it's presented to you on screen, is a bit like coffee without caffeine. You see the horror without actually seeing the dead bodies. You see the horror without actually seeing the abused people, you know, the, the, the corpses, the, the mangled flesh. You don't see any of that. So it's coffee without caffeine. Uh, it's a hyper-real as well as unreal kind of a commodity which is constructed and produced and consumed in spectacles uh, across the globe uh, in a way that is televised, in a way that is shot and, and, and recorded. Is uh, the choreography and the cinematography uh, is very similar to cinematography used in Hollywood cinema. And again, Zizek is very, very careful uh, in terms of connecting uh, the discursive content, the discursive quality uh, of Hollywood cinema, or Hollywood shooting, Hollywood cinematography, and connecting that to the macro spectacle of political horror, uh, for instance, as it operated when the World Trade Center collapsed in 9 11. So we'll stop at this point, the, the first lecture on Zizek's um, Welcome to the Desert of the Real, and we'll continue with this book in the following lectures. Thank you for your attention.